Good morning. Welcome to the Transmission Infrastructure Panel. Good morning. Welcome to the Transmission Infrastructure Panel. My name is Tim Heidel. I'm the panel lead for this morning's panel. And I'd like to introduce Larry Makovich of Cambridge Energy Research Associates, who will serve as our moderator this morning. Thanks, Tim. Well, thanks, Tim. And I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to this panel today. Uh, it's certainly a very interesting time to be talking about uh, transmission issues, the policies, the technologies, and the challenges ahead. For the sessions that we've had already in this conference, uh, we've talked a lot about new emerging technologies, particularly on the power side. And it makes us realize just how critical a piece of infrastructure the transmission networks in this country are. And going forward, the kind of new demands we're going to be putting on these networks to integrate a much more different set of sources of electricity with very different production characteristics being determined by the wind and the sun, as well as very different control systems people want to see on the demand side. And at the core of all this, in the middle of all this, is this critical infrastructure of transmission. The transmission grids in the United States, uh, I think, represent one of the largest and most complex machines that you can find anywhere on Earth. Uh, the power business is one of the most capital-intensive businesses you'll find in the whole U.S. economy, requiring about $3 of invested capital to produce $1 worth of revenue in a year, which is over twice the average you'll find within the industrial sector. So when we look at transmission, we're talking about a very capital-intensive part of the power business. It looks like we've got about $90 billion of transmission plant in place today. Uh, revenues to cover that in your electric bill are about 9% of your bill. If you put the distribution uh, in with the transmission, the wires network is about a third of the capital and revenue requirements in the power business. So capital is very important. We're currently looking at about $12 billion of investment each year going into these critical infrastructure wires, networks, and powers. And that's going up. There's a graph in the handout here that shows you what it is for the investor-owned utilities. Uh, and when you add in the federal uh, and other government spending there, it's a little bit higher. But if you look back in time, what's most remarkable is that uh, when you think about the replacement requirements of this uh, $90 billion infrastructure and the growth requirements of the power sector, it looks like we ought to be spending about $8 billion or more each year. As we look backwards, uh, what we saw is we went through a decade where we spent about half that every year. So there is a bit of a backlog, a bit of underinvestment that looks like it's happened in this very critical sector here. Big new challenges on the horizon. Renewables capacity, just the laws that are on the books today requiring renewables mean that we're going to have a five-fold increase in the interconnection and integration of renewables uh, into these networks. Now, this is an infrastructure that we have great demands going forward on, but we tend to take it for granted. You know, it takes a big blackout like we had in 2003 to really get uh, action here. Uh, and it's a sector that also has been prone to having expectations very different from reality. It wasn't long ago that this critical infrastructure was something people recognized would be essential to redoing uh, the connection between consumers and producers in competitive markets in power with deregulation. And the idea there was this sector would transform into transcos, transmission, uh, a number of companies whose sole focus was on transmission. We have a few independent transmission companies today a few new ent entrants, of which we'll hear about uh, with one of our panelists, and some integrated companies that have morphed themselves into primarily network and wires companies, of which our panel will talk about today as well. But we've never really gotten to the original idea of an 
independent transmission-oriented set of companies. So expectations and realities have always been an issue in this business. There's a lot of change ahead uh, for this network function. And so to look at some of these issues and explore them today, what I'd like to do is first turn to Lori Aylesworth, who's the Vice President in Charge of Transmission at Northeast Utilities. And Northeast Utilities is probably the leading example of one of these traditional utilities that divested their generation is, and today is one of a dozen companies that you would look to the power sector as a true wires and network oriented company with tremendous growth in investment in the years ahead. So with that, let me turn it over to Lori. Thank you, Larry. Can everyone hear me okay? Good morning. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to be here today. I thank Tim and the, his team for inviting me, and it's certainly uh, uh, a distinguished honor to share the panel, uh, the stage with the panel uh, with these gentlemen as well. I plan on spending a lot of my uh, time today talking about the challenges that Northeast Utilities Transmission Group faces and what we will be facing over the next decade or two as we try to incorporate some of the uh, challenges we see uh, in ahead of us. Um, but first, I just have to say, I don't know how many in this room actually got the opportunity to go up to the showcase last night. I have been in the electric utility industry all my professional life, and I can tell you, I don't think I've ever been in a place where I saw so much enthusiasm and so much energy around our industry, and that just makes me thrilled to see this coming, because our industry certainly needs the kind of input that the MIT students are, are really uh, out there pushing. Thank you very much for all that. Um, as, as Larry said, NU is the largest utility in, northeast, uh, in the Northeast. We cover three states. Uh, okay, let me get, there we go. We cover three states. We have over 3,200 miles of transmission, and that in turn provides electricity for over 2.4 million customers. NU has become one of the foremost authorities on actually building transmission. I've had the pleasure of being able to reside over this build. Um, as you can see by our chart, in the last two years, we've increased our capital spend by over $500 million. My capital spend last year was $750 million. I have between one and a half and two billion dollars worth of construction going on right now. As I see it, the electrical sector in New England is at a fundamental inflection point. I call it the perfect storm. New England faces many energy and capacity challenges over the next several decades as it simultaneously tries to address the problems of reliability, the environmental mandates, and the economic impacts of those. And in that, energy and the environment are inherently linked. So what are we going to do? Well, meeting New England and Connecticut's reliability and, and environmental goals will require a portfolio of solutions. By 2020 to 2025, we are going to be in New England 8,000 megawatts short. Our current heavy, heavy dependency on natural gas puts us at a very volatile point for our electric prices. Natural gas sets the clearing price in New England over 90 percent of the time. So the challenge is ahead. Sorry about that. Challenges ahead. First, let's discuss the renewables, renew the um, RPSs, Renewable Portfolio Standards. First, every state in New England has a set. They're all different. Currently, about 10 percent of our power in New England is delivered from, from some sort of renewable source. But by 2020, in New England, we are predicting a renewable resource gap of almost 17,000 megawatt hours. What does that translate in? Well, we could build 50 new uh, wood burning plants, or we could put in 2,000 megawatts of wind turbines, or actually 2,000 wind turbines, and we could put in 8 million rooftop solar panels. So you can see that for New England, this is going to be quite a challenge. Now, on top of that, we have the, uh, on top of the renewables, we have the REGI, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiatives. And how is that going to impact us? This is a 10-state uh, initiative, covers New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and all the New England states. 
by 2020, we are going to have a gap of over 31 million megawatt hours of carbon uh, emitting generation that we have to replace. That's equivalent to 4,500 megawatts of baseload generation that we're going to have to get off the system. How does transmission play into this? Well, our tra traditional role is just to ensure bulk quantities of electricity flow with a high degree of reliability from the generator to the load centers. We also have a new role as we try to facilitate the delivery of electricity in the wholesale markets. <clears throat> um, we also have system security. What do I mean by that? We have to keep the lights on. Recently, you guys probably heard about the incident that happened down in Florida, and even just a couple weeks ago, Texas came very close to rotating blackouts. Big thing, transmission is an enabler. It's an enabler of the competitive energy markets by removing constraints that can inhibit full competition. We had a really good example of that with the Bethel Norwalk project. That was the first phase one of our Southwest Connecticut project. First year went in, in service in 2006, first year, it saved over $150 million Connecticut ratepayers for congestion costs. Transmission also empowers the power, is, enables the power to get from the uh, remote sources to the load. Real quickly, here's some of the places that the renewable energy and uh, carbon emission, uh, free carbon emission generation is located. Here are a couple ideas that NU is working on as far as being able to link to that power. What are the barriers that we face? To date, transmission has been built for one reason, reliability. In the competitive marketplace, we've got to take in economic savings, fuel diversity, the, re the renewable compliances, the REGI compliances, and all need to be considered. Right now, there is um, a ISO New England is re responsible for the regional planning process, and they have a uh, <clears throat> They're moving forward on several fronts. They have a working group to try to find out how to do economic studies so that we can start building for economics and for, for environmental purposes. And they have a, a working group to try to prioritize how they do these working studies. We need an equitable cost allocation method for new transmission to connect to the economic and environmentally driven generation. We need the ability to sign long-term contracts. The remote siting increases our operability risks. We're going to have to really study that. And we, of course, we have the siting, permitting, and building of transmission, which is extremely challenging to do in New England. So with that, I, I say that NU looks forward to this. We feel we have a lot of challenges ahead, but we also think we have a lot of opportunities. We do think it's going to take a portfolio approach, we need everything in New England. We need renewables, we need con conservation, we need energy efficiency, we need wind, we need, and we need the transmission lines to get us there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. Uh, next, I'd like to have uh, Jess Totten uh, come up. He's uh, Director of Competitive Markets with the Public Utility Commission in Texas. And to just set uh, Jess up, when you look around the country, I mentioned the kind of cycles that we've seen in transmission investment. Well, Texas is a state that for a variety of reasons seems to be leading this investment wave across the U.S. There's more transmission investment happening there than most places. And it's also a state with the most wind energy integrated into a network now. So a lot of the challenges that uh, are ahead in Texas, I think, are harbingers for what we've got in the New England system and elsewhere. So Jess, if you could please give us some insights into the Texas situation. Thanks, Larry, and thanks to Tim and the team for inviting me. I'm very happy to be in uh, Massachusetts. I was thinking this morning that uh, Texas, like Massachusetts, kind of cherishes its uh, heritage of fighting for independence. And after we remembered the Alamo and after we defeated uh, Santa Ana, we created an independent power grid in Texas. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the very fortunate things that we have in Texas is that we do have a power grid 
where we don't have to fight with other states or the federal government about how we're going to manage our transmission grid. And so we've developed some policies in Texas that are a little bit different from some of the other states and from the federal government. And, and one of those was that uh, as we were encouraging new generators to come into the state in, of Texas in anticipation of retail competition, we took the approach that new generators were putting a significant investment into the state for their generation facilities and that we weren't going to require them to also invest in transmission. Uh, in, a lot of, in many parts of the country, it has been the case and still is the case that a generator has to also make payments uh, to, to the uh, transmission operator in order to get the transmission they need to interconnect and to move to market. The approach we took in Texas was that that investment should be made by the transmission companies, but we also instituted policies that allowed the uh, transmission companies to recover those investments more quickly from customers. Now that process worked pretty well for thermal investment. A company that wanted to build a thermal plant would sign an interconnection agreement with the transmission provider, would pay a deposit for the uh, facilities that needed to be built, and they'd both start building. The transmission provider would start building the transmission, the generation developer would start building the generation. They knew the respective schedules and they generally came together at about the same time. It might take three or four years to build the uh, generation facility and in that time it was typical that the transmission provider could get the facilities licensed and could get them built. And so you, you had a happy coincidence of the transmission and the generation being completed at the same time and the developer got his deposit back and everybody was in business. It didn't work so well for wind development. Part of the problem is, of course, that wind can be put up very quickly. Uh, in Texas, uh, we have areas that are not quite as beautiful as Massachusetts, and people are very happy to have revenue-earning wind turbines on their dry West Texas land where the wind blows like crazy. The problem is uh, most of that suitable land is a long way from our major cities. And so we're talking about building transmission facilities three, 350 miles in order to move the power from West Texas to Dallas to Austin, San Antonio, and Houston. And in this situation, we, we developed an inability to get the transmission built because the generator wouldn't sign the interconnection agreement. There was simply too much risk putting that deposit down and beginning the development process with the uncertainty about whether the transmission would be there uh, when the generation, when the wind farm was completed. So our legislature directed us to uh, undertake a, poly a uh, procedure called the Competitive Renewable Energy Zone process. And it's really an effort to link or relink what had worked well for uh, the thermal generation, to, to put the planning uh, and the construction back in sync so that we would build transmission and have it completed uh, by the time that the, the generation plants were in place. So the Commission has been uh, looking at areas in West Texas that are suitable for wind development. The wind developers have uh, come to the Commission and provided information on the areas that they think are the most appropriate. Uh, the Commission has had our independent system operator conduct a study of uh, different scenarios, different levels of development of uh, wind, uh, give a first estimate of the cost of the facilities for each of those scenarios. Uh, and the Commission, uh, I expect this summer, will be in uh, rendering a decision in, in that case to identify the zones, identify the levels of wind development, and identify the transmission that will need to be built for those zones. And once all of that is done, the licensing process will then be completed for the transmission, uh, the, and the transmission construction will go forward, and the, the development of those uh, wind farms can also go forward. The four scenarios that we're looking at involve uh, transmission investment in the range of 
$4 billion to $6 billion. Obviously, this isn't all going to be done over a single year, so it's going to be a multi-year project. Uh, and the additional wind development that we expect uh, will be somewhere between 5,000 megawatts and uh, 18,000 megawatts. Uh, I think it's going to be a difficult decision for the Commission because we, we are beginning to see operational issues associated with wind. Uh, but, you know, I expect that we will be able to complete the process this summer and move forward with this uh, reintegrated approach to, to transmission and generation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jess. Uh, the third panelist is uh, Stephen Conant, and uh, Steve is the Vice President of the New England Independent Transmission Company. And, uh, you know, transmission networks have evolved now for uh, close to a century to what we have today. And, um, and what we've got, though, is a very interesting set of new entrants, of which Steve's company represents one. And this morning we heard about venture capitalists and the importance of entrepreneurial drive. And we're starting to see some of that from these new entrants uh, into the networks, uh, particularly with the vehicle of uh, high-voltage direct current transmission lines, which today are maybe 5 percent or so of the networks, the rest being the alternating current lines, but a technology that may in the long run be very transformative to these fundamental uh, networks that we all rely on. So with that, let me turn it over to Steve. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Larry. My, my first challenge is to see if I, I have a couple of, here we go, illustrative slides. I, I want to thank the uh, MIT Energy Club and congratulate you on putting together an excellent conference. And uh, as I'm standing here, I realize you've got one of the fundamentals down, which is as a person sitting right in the front here, and she, you can't see, him in the, she, see her in the back, but she has a little 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, and at five minutes she holds up the thing, and at two minutes she holds it up, and at one minute she holds it up, and then she says, time. So I know how much time I have. Um, I also want to say that it's a real pleasure. Um, having worked at a company in the city of Boston that was founded by two MIT engineers, Stone and Webster, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, speaking at MIT. And finally, I'd like to say thank you to Henry Daher, a colleague of mine from National Grid for connecting me with Tim Heidel uh, to, hear, to be here to talk today. Um, uh, New England Independent Transmission uh, Company and some of our affiliates, which is the uh, Neptune Regional Transportation Transmission System and the uh, Hudson Transmission Partners, are entrepreneurial, but not entrepreneurial in the sense that we're developing new technologies. It's more that we're deploying technology that has been around for 50 years. Um, these are submarine DC cables, which are, uh, first one was put in in 1954, 61 miles. Uh, a lot in the North Sea, basically the, uh, to coordinate um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the AC systems uh, for synchronicity between them. Uh, the longest being 360 miles from uh, Norway to the Netherlands, and, and they've actually gone deep as well as uh, 3,000 feet deep. So this is not new technology that I'm talking about today. It's really um, talking about strategic deployment. When John Doerr um, spoke this morning, he talked about the difference between uh, missionaries and mercenaries. Uh, we're definitely of the missionary mode, and we have a strategic approach to how we uh, deploy the technology as opposed to a real uh, opportunistic one. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, sort of fundamental things about uh, we use D.C. in, if you will, a strategic, uh, almost a niche market. Um, a couple of uh, things just to highlight comparing subsea cable, which we uh, have been using, uh, as opposed to a traditional, say, 345 uh, kV system, some of the relative advantages. Very little right away that we need laying it across the ocean. Um, after we disturb the area that we've gone through, it uh, settles back into place and there's no long-term maintenance associated with it. Um, there's no, not too, many, too much nimbyism. Uh, the fish, if you will, um, don't vote, although there are a lot of environmental concerns. I don't mean to downplay the role of fishermen and, and, and things like archaeological resources, but um, for, for certain uh, 
applications, it has an advantage to an over, overhead AC line, which isn't going through somebody's uh, backyard. Um, and I'm sure Laurie can uh, speak a lot about what they dealt with in southwest Connecticut. Um, not an easy crowd to deal with. And uh, finally, there's no visual long-term impact. <laughs> Uh, the, the, really, the thing that you see with our uh, uh, DC systems is the basic technology is you're taking the AC grid, you're connecting to the AC grid, uh, converting um, from AC to DC with a converter station. That's the major piece of uh, equipment, the major capital expense, if you will. Uh, the, the, the nice thing about it, these are passive devices. They have uh, no emissions, very little noise. Uh, they typically require 10 to 15 acres of property, and the building design is very flexible. The places that we have uh, used these, uh, and I'll, I'll show them and give you some of the relative advantages, we've, we've got two projects that were uh, completed just last year, the Neptune project, which is a DC cable uh, running from, I'm getting my two-minute uh, mark here, uh, running from New Jersey to Long Island. Essentially in that, it's a... a a contracted line with Long Island Power Authority. It was cheaper for Long Island Power Authority to contract with us to uh, buy power in the PJM market, ship it by DC cable and into Long Island. It was cheaper for them to do that than to build a power plant on Long Island. Similar on the Hudson Transmission Project, we have a contract with the New York Power Authority to uh, ship uh, 500 megawatts of power from New Jersey uh, across the Hudson River. In this case, we have a back-to-back uh, DC system, we convert uh, AC to DC, then back to AC, which gives us a controllable line. We can control the amount of flow that goes across it. And then it's an AC line across the Hudson River into West 49th Street. Anybody here want to try to build a power plant in West 49th Street? <laughs> so there's the competitive advantage that we have in that market. A little bit different, and I'll probably save some of my remarks on Green Line. Um, we anticipated a need, which Laurie described a couple years ago, of flowing power from northern New England, primarily Maine, to the heart of Boston, where there's going to be a need for generation in the uh, 2013 time frame. You're not going to build a new power plant in downtown Boston. You can redesign one of those converter stations to look very nice on the ball. Boston waterfront, but how do you get green power with the need for 7,000 megawatts of power in New England? How do you get that into the largest load in New England? And the best uh, solution to that is by an under undersea cable. That being said, I'll, uh, final thing I'll say about is that we're new to the market and we're working with existing wonderful utilities like National Grid, Northeast Utilities. We've actually moved into their space a little bit. We've become an independent transmission company, which would allow us to rate-base a project like that, this in New England. And we're part of a number of proposals to solve the problem of moving power north to south in New England. I'll be happy to answer any questions, and thank you for having me. questions for our panelists, and then we'll uh, open it up to questions from the floor. Uh, and to ask questions from the floor, uh, raise your hands, and we've got some folks here with uh, microphones that will bring them over to you. But uh, let me start off, uh, Jess, uh, with a question. Uh, Texas being on the forefront of a lot of transmission investment, integration of wind, the CREZ uh, approach that you've taken is fairly innovative. I think you've seen California try to uh, mimic that. And you mentioned that, you know, Texas had a big advantage in that it's a transmission grid contained within a single state. As you look broader across the U.S. at the challenge there from the interstate grids to do all this integration, is your sense that uh, they'll be as successful as Texas, or are you uh, skeptical that the job will get done? Well, I, th I think it's going to be a very difficult job. Uh, you know, the problems that you face in New England are similar to the problems that you're going to face in the Midwest. There's a lot of wind, not only in, say, the Texas Panhandle, but Oklahoma, western Kansas. And the, the problem is that, like West Texas, there's not many people out there, and you really need to move that power long distances to places like uh, St. Louis and Chicago and Atlanta, uh, I don't know, maybe even New York and Boston. Can you get the transmission built? Uh, I mean, there's lots of permitting hurdles. There's lots of, uh, I would call it rate recovery hurdles. The, 
the people in western Kansas want to have that transmission built. They want to see the wind developed, but they don't necessarily want to pay for the wind or pay for the transmission if the, the people using the uh, energy are in St. Louis and Chicago. So they're difficult problems to work out. I, you know, I'm optimistic that we will, but I think it's going to take a lot longer than it has in Texas. Okay. Sure, go ahead. I'd like to add to that. Um, building transmission projects within a state is difficult enough. Um, I, we're doing it. We've, we're doing it in southwest Connecticut and other places in, in Massachusetts and in New Hampshire. However, most of these projects to access the remote sites for wind, for hydro, for perhaps nuclear outside of the New England area is going to take transmission being built through multiple states. That complicates the issue by by, you know, just by tons. Um, it's bad enough to put a 180-foot transmission pole in somebody's backyard when they're the benefit of that project. It's going to be extremely difficult for us to put that 180-foot pole in somebody's backyard when up in upper New Hampshire or upper state of Maine when, we're, when they know that it's connecting the electric cord down to Boston and New York, and they're not going to get any benefit from it. So that's going to be one of the big hurdles we have got to get over in areas that, like New England, where we don't go very far before we're out of our state. Yeah. So transmission investment on the rise, all these political challenges increasing, and some bottlenecks that may become uh, more critical in the not-too-distant future. In that regard, uh, some people's problems are also some people's opportunities. Steve, when you talk about political resistance and the difficulty of building a power plant on Long Island or West 49th Street, are these problems and the kind of opportunities that your D.C. connections provide, will the D.C. opportunities be enough to drive this business of yours going forward, or do you really need to think about expanding into the A.C. network investment as well? Well, we're not resistant to the AC network. We've found that DC works very well for us in a kind of a niche market, if you will, where we're um, making our inroads to the system itself. I will say it's a, it's a sort of follow-up on the previous uh, discussion because it affects that. One of the risks that we have taken as entrepreneurs is if you see our line comes out of the state of Maine and comes into the city of Boston, uh, Maine is extremely sensitive and recently has uh, considered leaving ISO New England, which is the operator of the grid, in, in part um, because of uh, forward capacity market issues, but also because of the, uh, and Jess referred to it, the uh, transmission cost allocation, who pays for the lines. The folks in Maine pay 8 percent of the uh, um, how many billion dollars in, in Southwest Connecticut that Northeast? They pay a portion Shush. of that uh, <laughs> for, reli for reliability uh, purposes. So they're resistant to pay for a line, which is e essentially export power from their state to the folks down here in Massachusetts. So that's one of the risks that we try to manage in our, in our project. Good, thanks. Well, that uh, point about here's a very complicated system that has network economics. It's very difficult to say who really benefits from a additional transmission investment in AC network because it all depends on how the future uh, plays out. And I think, Jess, you had uh, made some comments there. There seemed to have been a trend towards spreading and socializing the cost of these network investments rather than trying to identify who benefits and, Laurie, I think you're saying New England's going the same way. Do you, do you see that as the general trend in this sector? Well, I think that's a, a solution that's feasible in a, in a state, within a single state, as, as is the case with Texas. You know, we have a system that covers most of the state, and, you know, we decided that ultimately everybody benefits from additional investment, and so everybody was going to pay uh, the, essentially the same rate. We continue to uh, make improvements to the grid, and you know the hope is that everybody benefits in the same way from from those uh, investments. I think it's a lot harder to make that work in the interstate or multi-state arena, and so 
we may have to come up with more complicated solutions uh, than that simple uh, everybody pays the same rate approach. Yeah, I think that's going to be a challenge ahead of us. I do think uh, from our point of view, what in order to, to get around some of this opposition of, of uh, kind of sharing the cost of these big projects, is we've got to make this a regional solution. We feel very strongly that it is not a solution that just us as in you as a company can, can look at in a silo by itself. We have to bring along, we have to make it a win-win for everybody. And so, you know, you think about where some of these projects might be sited, you know, northern New England, um, up in Maine, up in New Hampshire, in, in areas of Canada that are not very populated. Those areas are also very, you know, they're, they're weak economically. Um, so a lot of those communities are actually looking for this kind of investment. So I think, you know, to just for, you know, try to just to put a boundary around it, I th think we feel in New England and in, in Northeast Chile that it has to be a New England regional solution. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions uh, out there in the audience? Okay, there's a few there. So let's go. We'll start one here, and then the second one will be down in the back here. And um, we'll get the microphones over to you here. Thank you. How much benefit do uh, large users of electricity gain or help you in transmission if they install their own power, such as uh, ones going on in southern Connecticut? <clears throat> Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Can you rephrase it? If a large it? energy user um, installs their own power plant. Oh, like, okay, a cogen? Cogen plant. Yeah. How much benefit is that to relieving the stress on the transmission? I will tell you right now, we need everybody involved. It's not, the cogens are welcomed. You know, conservation is welcomed. Everything is going to help. Right now, if Reggie stays the way it is, and by the way, Reggie is less conservative than the Lieber Lieberman-Warner bill, so that'll even put higher uh, impacts on us. Take the Reggie, you add the renewable requirements, you take the need for us to upgrade and maintain our existing infrastructure just for, to handle load growth. We're going to need absolutely everything we can, we can get our hands on to solve this problem regionally. So we welcome CoGen. We, we obviously, um, you know, there's some policy issues that have to go be made in order to make all this work. But uh, we as a, as a utility feel it's going to take all of these types of, of things happening in order to uh, make it to the future with these kind of requirements. Yeah, you know, I think the question's a, a good one. It points out location matters a lot. Additional supply from cogen or wind behind a bottleneck in a transmission system, you know, like more up in Maine, for example, doesn't help New England out anywhere near as much as if you got some additional generation down in Norwalk, right? Well, that's true. And um, the other thing that we're seeing as, as we do our planning studies is that when we start um, putting all these long transmission lines uh, in the system, we're connecting to very weak areas elect electrically. And what that does versus a, a cogen right in the right location where the load is, when we start running all these electric cords to these very weak uh, areas, it creates an electrical system that does not operate well. And, and you have to put a lot of band-aids on it, such as reactive, dynamic, uh, reactive uh, resources and things like that. So it's not only, it, it's within the bottleneck, which helps economically, but it actually helps electrically as well. Okay, we had a question in the back there, and then the next one will be right here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a very interesting session. I have three quick questions. One for Steve. I'll ask all three and then do what you want. One for Steve is with uh, high voltage DC for the same footprint of an existing 350 or 500 kV AC corridor, can you actually carry more, more load? In other words, could you replace an existing corridor with a DC, high voltage DC corridor and actually get more load? That's the first question. For Jess, you alluded to some problems with wind power, and I was wondering if it had to do with the actual generators or if it was more with the grid. And for Lori, my question was, have you guys considered swinging power through DC lines from Nova Scotia under sea into uh, Maine and New England? Thank you. 
All right, let's take them in order then. HVDC on AC corridors. Uh, the, the, the truth... The truth of the matter is that we need new transmission lines and we wouldn't re really replace anything at all. Um, we, we just need more of it. Uh, our strategic advantage is that um, we think we can get it permitted and constructed a lot easier than a terrestrial line. But a DC system needs to work, especially in New England, in close harmony with a very strong AC system. So there's a lot of improvements to the AC system in Maine that are really going to facilitate our project from Wiscasset to Boston being constructed. All right, Jess, there was one tossed your way there. The problems we've seen recently with wind has largely been the inability of the operator to see the wind output. We've had a couple instances recently where um, the load has been picking up dramatically as the temperature cools off uh, in the evening and the wind is dropping significantly at the same time. And so you, you have this concept of uh, net load, the, uh, the additional load pl uh, plus the uh, drop-off in the wind production, and the thermal generation has to make that up. And if the operator can't see it, that, that's a big problem. So that's something that we're working on now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Longer term, I think we are going to have to work to uh, modify our market rules. We rely on thermal generation to provide things like load following and balancing energy. And the, I'm, I'm not sure the current rules are going to fairly compensate them if there are periods when wind production uh, dominates the pricing. So I think that's something that we're going to have to work on on a longer term. That's a helpful comment, Jess, and I think most people think of transmission systems as towers and wires, uh, but the reality is the control systems, measurement and management through time are every bit as important to this infrastructure, if not more important given the changing demands we see in the years ahead. So I think that sets us up for the third question there. I think it's true that uh, New England may be importing less from Canada today than we did 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, do you see the transmission network uh, facilitating a turnaround there? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, I, <laughs> I had to go very fast past that slide in my presentation, being as uh, Mimi was holding up the one-minute uh, threat. Um, so I went boom, boom. Uh, but conceptually, yes, we are working on, uh, on ideas of uh, transmission lines into Canada, not only Nova Scotia, but into the uh, Hydro-Quebec area as well. Uh, D.C. would be a, a very good option for us on something like that. Um, but as Steve said, D.C. can be the electric cord up to that area, but once we get down here, New England has an A.C. system. So from that point on, we would be looking at uh, A.C. Uh, concepts to get it from northern New England down to southern New England with a few options for D.C. connection to even do that as well. Okay. Uh, before we go to this one, way in the back there, you've had your hand up, so you'll be next, but go ahead. Me? Oh, thank yeah. you. Uh, I'm surprised by the a lack of discussion in one area. Uh, there's a significant loss of power in transmission, right, 30, 50 percent. Um, so I guess my question specifically for this conference is where's the innovation? Where's well, the innovation? losses in transmission run 6 to 8 percent typically, uh, U.S. Uh, but as far as innovation goes, there's lots of discussion regarding uh, smart grids and more control to uh, affect some of that. Uh, anybody with a comment on that? I'd just say for, for long-term transmission, DC is, is much fewer losses uh, on a DC system. The innovation, as I stated right from the beginning, um, this is technology that's been with us for a long time. The only innovation we're, we're seeing is with uh, voltage source converters where you have uh, what ABB has called something called H, uh, HVDC Lite, and Siemens, who is our, our vendor, is, has HVDC Plus. The innovation there is they can actually put that system on a much smaller footprint, and it also can provide VAR, uh, generate VARs as well, which is important to uh, keeping voltage, uh, controlling voltage in some areas. So there's some innovation there. Um, there's also some innovation moving, in actually larger lines moving at longer distances. And, and with regard to uh, your DC lines where you're taking AC, converting to DC, then converting back across systems that aren't synchronous, roughly what kind of losses are you looking at there? 
that's uh, something I would refer to my engineer. Okay. <laughs> let, me, let me point out okay. another area of innovation. Uh, you know, California has a huge uh, solar project. Uh, California, uh, Arizona has a, a pretty large solar mandate, too. The, the, solar is a way of bringing uh, pr uh, energy production right to the urban area. And I think that uh, that is an innovation that has a, a lot of promise for at least the Southwest. I don't really understand why New Jersey is pushing it, pushing it so hard, but I, I think for the Southwest it will be a great resource. Okay. So we're back there, and then after that one, we'll go right here. Go I wonder ahead. if the panel could address the evolution of the grid from the supply side. Um, the old original grid was one to many, and now we're sort of few to many. How do you see that evolving with more suppliers, and what are the issues as far as transmission when you uh, have a more open grid? Well, first off, I think that the biggest challenge is that um, where we had a, a few very, very large baseload units, and now we're going to, like you said, m more units spread out farther, um, are mostly in New England because of the age of the, of, of the grid. We, our grid right now was built around those few large baseload units, um, the, the nuclear plants, uh, the big coal burners, um, and the gas-fired plants. Um, now, because, we, one, those units are all getting very old, and a lot of them are going to be retiring. Um, and now we have new generation much further away. It, it puts the planning process at, at the crux of the matter. I mean, it is now not uh, an easy a solution to find, like I, like I mentioned before, we're going to have to prop up the system electrically in different ways in order to operate it with the same level of reliability that we do today. So it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge. Yeah, I, I would add to that that uh, the grid does have a whole new set of demands. You're right. It was originally built uh, to connect uh, power generation to the load, and it expanded uh, out and um, and now with these new demands of distributed generation and more control uh, and greater integration challenges, the job is changing significantly. And one thing that's been brought up here with the very complicated example of Southwest Connecticut and the the real physical problems you have uh, that it's hard to look at a transmission network and understand how much inefficiency you have in there, even congestion. Uh, measurements are tough because they're so dependent on f relative fuel prices. And so we do have varying levels of problems in the grids, but it's hard for people to see them until you get a crisis and then you get a big investigation and months later you get a fault analysis. And, you know, for example, back in August of 03, you know, the conclusion was it was those software systems, the data accumulation uh, integration and systems management that led to people not having situational awareness was the term that they used. And so that's a difficult thing to see until problems crop up. So it'll be a big challenge uh, going forward, I'm pretty sure. Well, just to add to that, just the event that we had in Florida two months ago, two to three months ago, I forget. You know, you can see the frequency charts on that event. You can see them all the way up here to New England. You can see them all the way out to the Midwest, the impact of the, of the, of the outage there in Florida. That was caused by one guy wanting to get home too early for a vacation and doing something he shouldn't have done. And it impacted, you know, half of the United States. It, it wasn't as bad as it could have been, but it still had an impact. Right. Okay, the next question was here, and then we'll go to the back corner there. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, energy storage is an area where there's a good deal of innovation going on, and it's been discussed as a potential way to address uh, the variability in renewable output. What do you see as the role of energy storage over, say, the next 10 years or so in terms of easing um, the transmission issues and addressing the increasing renewable um, integration into the grid? Well, 
I'll just say there's a huge opportunity if, if it can be done successfully and cost effectively. You know, the wind doesn't blow when we need it to blow, and if we can use storage to deliver that energy when we need it, that would be uh, wonderful. I, it's a, a little out of my field, but I would say that the, uh, when you look at New England, um, Maine wants to add 2,000 to 3,000 megawatts of wind. Their um, peak load is about 1,500 or 1,000 megawatts. Um, when you add that much wind generation, you're going to need something to help control that system, whether it's load following capability, um, pump storage for hydro, or some kind of storage to even that out. Um, and that's actually, there's some flexibility offered actually with a DC system, but not nearly what you need in order to accommodate that much wind on the grid. Right, but this storage issue and the question of intermittency on a lot of renewables, solar and wind, uh, they are not really direct substitutes for conventional generation which means integrating and cost analysis is much more complex than most people appreciate. So the challenge is to integrate uh, these new sources well into these power systems is, is quite a challenge going forward. Energy storage would be great if it were economic, and the basic problem with the power business for quite some time is that it's far cheaper to build a peaking generating plant, a simple cycle combustion turbine as backup than it is to build storage, pump storage, uh, reservoir uh, storage from a hydro. Uh, the opportunities are limited and they tend to be very expensive, but I think your point is a good one. If there was one technology that could be completely disruptive to the power business as we know it, it would be economic storage. It would turn this business upside down. Uh, all right, so our next question is in this corner, and then we'll go over here. Go ahead. I'm Vic Stevens. I'm a, uh, I work with the Clean Tech Investment Bank. The question was totally apt just ahead of me. Uh, one of my clients has megawatt scale, dynamically uh, 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 usable uh, energy storage. And essentially, in the, in the ERCOT area, they've studied it for five years. They can double the return of wind farms. It provides deals with congestion and so forth. These are big grid-scale flow batteries. The question is, have you guys looked at these? Have you studied these extensively? These are between $200 and $300 per kilowatt and kilowatt hour. To put it in perspective, it's about two cents a kilowatt hour on an ongoing basis. It's about equivalent to pumped hydro. I don't know if anyone has looked at that technology in Texas. I know there is some interest in storage for uh, some remote locations that would involve significant transmission upgrades, but I haven't heard it discussed in the context of wind. Yeah, we've looked at the economics of storage at various points in time at CIRA. This particular technology, I'm not sure if, if we've run those numbers, but uh, you know, just to provide some background, uh, you know, for wind applications, for example, good wind runs 35% of the time. So you can start to get a sense of the kind of storage requirements you have to really make those economics and the dispatchability uh, work. But it certainly is uh, an opportunity that's uh, huge in the power sector. Afterward. But what's interesting is what you can arbitrage is exactly what you said. It's all the infrastructure and electronics that are not used the other two-thirds of the time where you can dynamically take on and put off in the grid. That's where the real economics are. Right. And it's a good point, too, because oftentimes the biggest technological changes are not from one innovation but a combination of two or three. And I think storage plus some of the things we're seeing in smart grid or renewables could really make a difference. All right, so we go to here, and then we'll go here. Good. Yeah, my name is Henry Daher. Uh, my question is to just, uh, please, uh, again, in Texas, uh, from economic perspective, when you were building all these huge transmission investments and socializing the cost across the, uh, the state, uh, there was, I'm sure that there was an additional uh, cost increase, but also it could be balanced with the cheaper power of wind. So can you give us a little bit perspective what was the additional cost on the trans, uh, Texas customer. And my second question, follow up just quickly. Uh, before going ahead and building this additional transmission, were you requiring some kind of guarantee from generator or some kind of contract from generator that certain generators are going to come in online 
whenever I build this additional transmission. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have the figures looking back. Uh, the study that ERCOT has done uh, associated with the CRES case is uh, f looking forward, and uh, my recollection is that for the, uh, the $4 billion uh, transmission investment, they are looking at roughly $1.2 billion of uh, reduction in uh, production power costs on an annual basis. Uh, so you would expect that uh, on a societal basis the cost of the transmission could be paid for in four years. Um, and your other question? Do you, do you require some kind of guarantee or some kind of right. Yes, there, there will be a security required for the wind developers as a part of the CREZ process. They, they will have to put some money down, uh, not to the same extent as in the past, but they will have to put some money down. Laura, you had made the point about it, how long-term contracts for this guarantee question would be so uh, critical going forward. What are the obstacles you see there? And then, uh, Stephen, is most of your development done with contracts to provide the certainty to get the investment? Go ahead, Laura, you can start. Um, first of all, to, um, to, that, to the last point is that, yeah, w uh, you know, you're going to need to have some sort of guarantee when you, when you go to commit to building all this transmission uh, from, the, from the builder of the generation. But from another point of view, uh, we, are, we as a utility are going to have to be able to go back to where we were 20 years ago where we could sign long-term contracts. Um, say, say we want to reach this extension cord up into Canada. Uh, you know, Hydro-Quebec or Nova Scotia, um, New Brunswick, they're not going to want to build out their system, whether it's hydro, another nuke plant at Point La Pro or whatever, unless they've got a, you know, a long-term contract to, to support them. So um, it goes both ways. Uh, right now we are not able, um, just because of uh, the laws of Connecticut, when we uh, deregulation and everything else happened, we are not able at this point to sign long-term contracts. Steve? Uh, two things. One, sometimes we're referred to as merchant. We're, there's nobody that will fund a merchant transmission project. We're contracted for both our uh, Neptune project, which is a, a long-term contract with Long Island Power Authority, who can do that because they're not regulated, they're even municipal, and New York Power Authority for our Hudson project. That, again, is a, a long-term contract, so those are straight project finance. Our, our strategy in New England is a little bit different. Um, we created what's called an independent transmission company, I think I mentioned before, um, which would actually provide us, if our project is selected, uh, access to uh, uh, the rate base as a pool transmission facility that would be selected. Or it could be a combination of the project that NU has, which Laurie showed on the board as well. Um, but these are all sort of traditional utility types of uh, rate-based projects. The thing that's interesting on that, if I just add another point that's happening in New England, and I think it's sort of a, a cutting edge, is traditionally the only types of projects that have been rate-based of those which have been done for reliability are essentially to keep the lights on. The ISO, through a very creative process, has a, a, a new process by which they're looking at um, doing economic projects. Those have been on the books, but the, the criteria under which you could uh, qualify an economic project has been very narrow. They're looking at broadening those so the projects that we talked about today for moving power north to south could ultimately be rate-based as economic projects. Okay, good. And you have the honor of the last question. All right. Uh, I'm interested in biofuels, and uh, biofuels are very hard to uh, transport. They could be used uh, for uh, electric generation, distri distributed generation. Um, the, obviously, the, the, the uh, smaller the unit, uh, the uh, less transportation you have to use. There's, lot, uh, there's lots of waste, uh, forestry waste in New England. And uh, uh, what c can you advise somebody who's just in the planning stages right now? What, uh, how big uh, they ought to look? I mean, you, you could. You don't want to make a, something as big as these uh, 15 uh, megawatt uh, uh, steam power plants based on uh, wood, but uh, uh, you could go down to something that's used for uh, a household that's got excess energy. Uh, and so uh, what advice do you give to pursuing this, this uh, direction? Okay. Distributed energy. 
if you're talking uh, from a distributed uh, standpoint, um, that's really not something that would have uh, an impact. I know in, in Maine, um, in, in qualification for renewable portfolio standards, which is driving a lot of the new transmission, there's a significant amount of potential biomass in the state of Maine. Um, things that are, uh, if you will, behind the meter, I think sort of back to Laurie's question, is a locational component there, and if you can compete with a project that gets you a cheaper source than what you buy off the grid, then it would work from that standpoint. At, at a larger scale, um, you'd be eligible for renewable energy credits, which could help finance your project. You know, we talked about these clean energy requirements, the renewable portfolio standards. About 90 percent of what's been developed to date has been wind. About 80 percent of what's in the pipeline going forward is wind. Solar is a distant second. So biomass is a very small piece right now of the outlook uh, going forward on clean energy. What's interesting is when you looked at some of that data on where does all the CO2 in the U.S. come from, about a third is power production, another third is transportation. If you get some very interesting innovation on the transportation side, so that you get a biofuel that's very competitive with gasoline and diesel in the transportation sector, and you get scale there because the transportation sector is so big, why then wouldn't you get some application into the power sector, in particular during the winter where you could burn some of these clean new bio diesels or biofuels to create some relief on gas bottlenecks, natural gas bottlenecks and so forth. So I think it might be a pleasant surprise down the road that uh, biofuels, uh, you know, could make a difference uh, in this kind of 10-year uh, time frame. But with that, uh, we've got to uh, call our close to our session, but I'd like to ask you all to join me in thanking our panelists for their <laughs> contributions.